to DSD live webinar Friday afternoon as usual and sorry I'm just trying to get my positioning right with this here we go all right let's try that again so good evening everyone welcome to DDS South Africa uh, online platform it's our usual time five o'clock Friday afternoon and uh, this afternoon in particular we're super delighted to have with us Dr. Eduardo Man. I mean, it's an absolute privilege having him with us. He's probably one of the busiest guys I know. Uh, and on that note, also probably one of the smartest and probably one of the nicest guys that we know as well. Uh, me personally, I can't seem to keep up with Eduardo because the amount of publications that come out with Eduardo's name on it, uh, I, I, I would love to know how he gets all of it in in his normal uh, work and day flow. So I want, to, I want to hand over to Eduardo. He's going to do a brief introduction to himself. He's going to tell us about how he got involved in dentistry and what he's doing currently. Yeah, so let's make that part quick, which is the less person. Uh, quick summary. So well, I'm Chilean. My father is German. I studied dentistry in Chile. Then I went to Germany where I did my doctorate. Then I moved to Switzerland where I worked with Ivo Carviva then. This is how my involvement with company started. I was two years there. Then I was kind of struggling if I stay there or if I marry my girlfriend that I had for years, left in Chile and then love prevailed. So we married and I didn't want to go back to Chile. So we got an offer in Saudi Arabia. We were there for two years since I wanted to see the world and travel a bit. And then after eight years abroad, I came back to Chile in, 12, in 2012, yeah. So, well, we were married since two or three years, then I became a father six years ago, and then again four years ago, and yeah, I'm trying to answer the question that, that you asked Sam, how we are managing to publish and work on the university and office. I will follow yeah. one of the advices that Arnold Schwarzenegger gave once to a university in the States in one of these famous speeches that we need to learn to sleep faster. That's basically the answer. <laughs> there's no magic. It. You need to sleep faster or you need to sleep less. That, yeah, there's no magic. Yeah. So, so, so Eduardo, just on that note, what, is, what does one day in your life look like? Just one 24-hour cycle, what does it look like? Yeah, yeah, before before COVID or after COVID. So before <laughs> COVID. Yeah. Before COVID. <laughs> yeah. So before, well, I distribute my time, I would say, roughly. So 60% of my time is in my private office. We own a, a big clinic, well, kind of big clinic, seven chairs plus surgery room. We have Sarek, Cone Beam, CBCT. We have an education center attached to it. And I also own, uh, with partners, a commercial lab that serves our clinic and serves other dentists. Around probably 60 or 70 dentists are. And institutions, universities, hospitals are sending us to our lab. So that's the main activities that I'm doing. University, I have, I run three programs, one-year programs, in aesthetic dentistry and digital dentistry, where I have my team. Of course, I don't have to be there all the time but I'm the director and the ones that organize and put them together. Uh, plus the traveling and courses that are roughly, I would say before COVID time, one week a month, probably I was somewhere in the world. Now I have been stranded since beginning of March here in Chile. That's a pretty, that's, that, that's a pretty intense, uh, intense day. It's, uh, it sounds pretty similar to mine, except for the, for the university part of it. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, I can, imagine, I can imagine the pressure and I can, I can very much relate to the volume and the content that you need to get through over that time period. Yeah. So, I mean, Eduardo, you've been involved with quite a few companies as well in terms of the technology and the development. Yeah. Where are we going when it comes to that? And, and what can we expect on the horizon? Uh, well, there I would divide it in, in products that haven't changed much, but kind of changed a bit, like direct techniques, where basically composites have been there in a similar way since 20 years. Yeah, not 30. In the 90s, there were major developments, but probably since this century, there are no big changes. Some small things like bulk fills that shrink a bit less, where you can fill bigger cavities. Uh, 
the colors have improved a bit, but it's more kind of like a concept or the way we're using them more than the real change in the technology. They, we're curing them faster, but there are little changes. So if, if you consider a modern composite now, you can cure them deeper and faster, and you have more colors, but 20 years ago, you could do somehow similar things to the ones that we're doing now. So I will leave this direct part aside since there are no major changes. Uh, and in the digital world, well, I mean, every year, every two years, we see new things. Uh, coming to, to the topic that we discussed that we're going to talk later, for example, facial analysis and integration of the smile and the face. We started the concept totally analog with normal pictures. We we're taking pictures with big cameras and yep. uh, lots of pictures. Then we change them and take the pictures with the iPad or with mobile phones because they were good enough, because they had more lenses. Then we change them in not taking intraoral pictures because we were scanning the mouth. So then now we are 3D scanning the face. So, I mean, this is huge. And this has been in six, eight years probably, just yeah. to give you a simple example. Yes. So, so currently, Eduardo, in your clinic, for example, can yeah. you describe the, the workflow that, that, that goes into actually digitizing your patient as they come into the clinic? So patient yeah. comes into the clinic, you take them through uh, the digitization process. Can you describe to us the different steps that you have, have added into that? Yeah. Oh, that's a good question because there I have, I probably, my opinion goes a little bit against what many companies are pushing and what many clinicians are showing in lectures. I'm not, uh, I'm not doing, I have a CEREC, I'm using it since 2005, and we have it in the clinic. Plus we have the lab, which is in the same floor basically. So it's connected through the clinic. Yes. It's another company, it has another entrance for people, for customers, but we are connected inside. So um, I still believe that machines like CEREC for busy clinicians, it serves you and they're supposed to serve you and you're supposed not to serve the company and you're supposed not to serve the machine. So I use my CEREC for quadrant dentistry. So I'm very happy to have it. I'm proud that I have it. I use it a lot. But whenever somebody comes with one, two, three molars, three molars, one single crown, inlays, onlays, this is why I use the CEREC and this is very efficient, very fast. And we have all the advantage of the one appointment dentistry. Which is not numbing the patient again, not putting temporaries, no contamination of the dentin. The, the patient pays you that session. It comes, yeah. dentistry is also business. We should not forget that and we live from that. Yes. But whenever I'm going into bigger cases where I need to invest more design and I have a, the, a more aesthetic, demanding aesthetics, then I have designers that are way better than I do in the lab and I either scan the whole mouth and I send it to the lab via Serec Connect, although we are for Wi-Fi because we are 20, 30 meters just the other side of the floor. Uh, or in some cases uh, where I'm not so happy or it's too expensive basically to make a very good quality model, I take a normal impression. I mean, I'm very practical regarding that because to have, I mean, we need to be realistic. Uh, uh, a 3D printer that costs $10,000, which is what the vast majority of the dentists have, they cannot give you a very good model for very precise fit of veneers. 100%. 100%. 100%. Yeah. So, and, and, yeah, so yep. sorry. And this is something that I believe that people are a bit uh, confused since they see in lectures and they see amazing models done with 3D printers, but this 3D printer scores $100,000. It's not the ten thousand dollar printer that yeah, yeah. most of us have. Yeah, and I think I think I think that's an amazing point that you brought up because I mean, w with us as well, we, you know, when it comes to full contour restorations, and we've got a very similar working setup to you have in terms of the lab and the clinic and that sort of thing, and what we do and what cases we outsource through the lab, uh, and and we find with those cases, I mean. When we start doing like those fine minimal prep veneers and you want to fit it to a model, I mean, the 3D printed models are just not efficient with the level of printers that we have. And I mean, our printer is probably $20,000, you know. Uh, we've got some of the, the, the printers there that are probably $5,000 printers. 
but the quality is just not there. So in those cases, you know, we still go analog. We scan, but we take an analog impression so that we've got something to fit it to, and that way we get a good, uh, a good fit and a good seat. Yeah. In terms of your, from the, from the facial scanning perspective, what have you incorporated into your workflow? Yeah, with facial scanning, since uh, I don't see the real, I see the problems we were talking before we, we, we were connected here. I see the main problems in the, the way people take the pictures and the way people record what is being done. So uh, I, I see there the problem, not necessarily in that we were taking a 2D picture or we were taking a video in the terms of, the, of diagnostic. Since uh, if you have the 3D scan, when you have it, it kind of changed the perception that you have. And the face looked different than the pictures. And this is something that we have to incorporate. I give always say I make the, the parallel to when we are designing, when we have a crown in our hand and we place it in the patient's mouth, it looks different than when I have it in the screen digitally designed. So it looks different in the model than in the screen. And you need to get used to that. So I believe that it's not the scanners, the face scanners are not that advanced there yet. They are not as simple because, of course, you cannot compare a $20,000 face scanner with the one that you get in the iPhone. So there are still things where I don't feel that it's really necessary to jump into that. So I don't see the, the rush in doing that, and that's why I have not done it myself. We have been doing it just to test it, just to identify the problems, just to speak with friends, with Bruno, with Kai, with Christian, the four, we are the four authors of the, of the publication, although Bruno was the first and coming with the idea, Christian put a lot of input since he had the experience. Uh, but I see that there is a lot to be done before it gets the standard. I don't see any rush in going into that yet. I think that's I think that's a that that's a super important point that you highlighted. You know, at the end of the day, you know, we've always got to be practical when it comes to these things. If you can do something better with what you have now, there's no point going and investing in technology or or, or, or trying to adapt the technology to make yeah uh, to fit your case. You know, yeah. you need to use it in such a way. And I think that's one of the points that I want to highlight through this webinar as well is that. You know, whatever involvement or incorporation you have in terms of digital technology, it has to be something that benefits your workflow and it's giving you something that's either more efficient or more accurate or more or, or better than doing it the analog. Definitely. And I see look, and I see the same. So I have been privileged in my life to be related to all of this and have the uh, the, the, the capability, the money or the possibilities to have these things. But I, I see, it happens to me yesterday in the practice. Look, I have a new dentist in my practice, and she was, and all of a sudden I heard that the girls were moving around. I was taking a picture of another patient, uh, and then the girls come to me and said, doctor, uh, somehow the, the blog broke, the crown broke. And I, I was listening to the Sarek Millen, and I said, my God, what happened? It never happens to me. I mean, it happens when I was starting that I was not preparing good enough on the inlay or the owner of the crown was too thin and it broke, of course, but since years, it never happened to me again. And then I look at it and, of course, it was because the crown was, she was preparing a partial crown and overlay, but with a very sharp angle with the fissure exactly in the connection and, of course, it broke. So was the steric doing a good job? Of course not. I mean, Probably, if she would have sent it to the lab, the lab would have told her, no way, this is going to break. We will reject your impression, and you will have to prep again if you're sending it to the lab. But the serving machine, of course, said nothing. The, the partial crown broke for the patient's luck, because otherwise she would have cemented, and then it would have break later on. So that's why technology by itself does not make you better and the technology needs to serve you and another point that i see that is important that we were talking before starting that there is a rush in many dentists in trying to buy technology that is expensive that put them into financial pressure and you don't really need them since there are labs for example like your lab like our lab and many other labs that can serve 
with the technology without you paying anything special for that. So you can take a normal impression, send it to a technology lab, and the lab will do everything for you, and you will just pay for that service, and you don't have to ask for a loan for $100,000 for a machine. And you can have an access to a 3D printer that is great, that the lab has, and will charge you just for that, for that specific action, and you will not have a machine that is very expensive that you will use it twice a week. So that's mm -hmm. a, something that I would really like to point out, so that that's people amazing. invest their money wisely. And I think that's that's something that we try to highlight, uh, you know, all the way through. And especially with the Digital Dental Society, you know, it's encouraging people to actually uptake the technology, understand the technology, but you don't necessarily have to go into spending exorbitant amounts of money. And that's something you can slowly build into your workflow, you know, and then decide at this point, okay, fine, you know, I'm now ready for a scan or I'm ready for a 3D printer or whatever it might be. Uh, yeah. And, and, and just one point I wanted to highlight around the conversation, uh, Edwarda, is that, you know, at large, you know, most dentists, and even myself for that matter, when I started off, I've been doing CAD CAM dentistry now for probably 14 years or 15 years. And when I started off, I didn't really understand instrument geometry and milling strategies and all those sort of things. And I mean, the, 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 the material back then, there was huge limitation. I mean, we were working with Impress 2 at the time. Emacs hadn't come onto the uh, onto the scene. We started off with Impress 2. The, 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 the capabilities of the molds were not what they are today. And, you know, you, you learn some hard lessons very quickly. And up till today, you know, having that background, you understand a lot better that when you're preparing, for example, and you want to do full CAD CAM, full monolithic mold restoration, your preparation has to follow a specific uh, parameter so that you compensate for the instrument geometry and you understand the milling strategy in terms of how that ceramic is going to be machined. And right. like, like Mark always says, you know, we have the technology. Mark, you say, you say it better than I do. Huh? No, I, I mean, this technology is, is great. We, we, we all know that. I, I don't think there's any turning back on technology where we are today. Um, but, you know, and, and again, if we go back to, to where we need it and, and where it fits into our practices, you know, I think that we're all working in different workflows. We're all different, working in different sort of situations. But um, the one thing that, that for me was crystal clear was that I, I was much more predictable as a dentist, you know. And again, it's down to planning. You know, I think that if you're not planning cases meticulously, then then I think whether you do it analog or digital doesn't really make that much yeah, difference. Yeah, yeah. Spending a lot of time planning a case, you know, then there is no question that following the digital workflow um, allows you to, to, to achieve the, the predictable results that you planned at the beginning. And, and that for me changed everything. You know? And so, of course, every now and then I take an impression, you know, because that's the way it is. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's the workflow from the beginning to the end that, that really is the game changer, you know, but, and it's the planning really that's the key. The technology by itself will not say, save you, that's the thing. And for example, a simple example that we started in the lab. We started doing veneers when we were making 10 or 12 veneers. Uh, then we were doing it full digital, complete digital workflow. And there was a point where I said, my goodness, but the block is quite expensive. So I was using 10 blocks, 12 blocks for veneers. Maybe we could use every now and then two veneers in one block. But then all of a sudden we said, why don't you just be smart? And we keep the initial digital workflow until we make we do everything digital. We mill the wax, and then we will inject right. the veneers. And then all of a sudden I was using one ingot and that thing will cost around one block for 12 veneers or for 10 or 6 or 8 veneers. I mean, we were we reduced the cost in ceramic. Of course, this is something that my friends in Ivocar don't like to hear. But I we have been joking in meetings and restaurants after this. But they say, well, at the end of the day, I mean, you are free to do whatever serves the purpose. And that's why the company has always brought you these products and we're selling blocks and we're selling ingots and if well, we're using less blocks you will use more blocks for English and only at the end of the day so we're happy as long as you stay with Ivocar but this proves you how efficient if you're smart and you understand how it works 
you can be mixing analog uh, injection, basically, that is there since 30 years with the whole digital development. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. uh, just on that topic, I mean, I had a case during the week, young girl, you know, she came in. We, uh, I mean, she's 17 years old. She had trauma to the front. And I did a DSD design for her, 3D printed the model, did a silicon index. We actually did a clear index for her. And for that case, you know, it was easy using that whole digital workflow, but rather than putting in ceramic, I chose to do direct composites. So I went, I had the mold, I had the design, it took 10 or 15 minutes. And you know what? We had an amazing exceptional result, yeah. digitally driven, but analog delivered. So exactly. Uh, you know, I love where this is going because at the end of the day, practicality is key yeah. and, you know, simplicity is key. And the minute you start integrating and you start mixing these things, you know, you get some amazing results out. And I think that's where the sweet part of spot lies. And I think that's where that's the message that we want to get across. Yeah. So two areas I want to drive from this. Eduardo. The first area is in terms of avatar, in terms of indirect restorations, Yes. Uh, is there any development coming that we can look forward to? Oh, there is something that is great. Yeah, good that you brought that. <laughs> have you tried a Sear Prime? I haven't. The new Zirconia, because no. in many countries it's still not available. But people in Europe, I believe it's available in the state of Europe. Mark, did you try it? Yeah. So that I, I actually when. We we did I when we were in lockdown I did a, a presentation on Zercad Prime for Ivoclaw here in South right. Africa. Yeah, yeah. So, so I've done many like cases. That, it's amazing. It's, yeah, it's really a breakthrough that people don't understand. There are now four generations of zirconia. We were talking about three. We can consider Zir Prime as a fourth generation unofficially. But the thing is that it happens to me here in Chile too that all of a sudden the people. The, the distributors stopped bringing more opaque zirconia and they were all selling translucent zirconia and ultra translucent yep. zirconia and all of a sudden uh, my crowns were too translucent when we for example making crowns on implants on implant mm -hmm. buttons uh, then i talked to my guys in the lab and i said guys i need something opaque again and uh, you can layer it or we can uh, see what we do at the end but we need to have at least one opaque zirconia i said well they're not bringing it anymore and when people uh, are sending to our lab, they don't understand when I t tell them, well, what kind of zirconia would you like to have? I mean, zirconia? <laughs> I mean, there are three generations of zirconia, and they're pretty different. They're very, very different. And Sear Prime is probably coming, and this is something that people didn't understand right. And uh, let me summarize this. When uh, glass ceramics came to the market, glass ceramics were great, were beautiful, they're still great, they're still beautiful, but they were too brittle. So Ivoclar came in the 90s with uh, Empress 1. So, and then came with Empress 2. And Empress 2 was not glass ceramic, it was, li well, glass ceramic, but it was lithium disilicate. It, it was not loose at rainforest. And people said, yeah, but we want something more stronger. We want to bear something very steady, but something very strong. Yeah, and then Empress 2 came, which was lithium disilicate. But people said, yeah, but it's not as beautiful as Empress 1, the Lewis at Rhineforce. And then I would say, well, guys, you want something stronger? You cannot win all the time. I mean, you yeah. need to sacrifice a bit to get something better. Yeah, and then Emacs came. And Emacs was an improved Empress 2. And then Emacs with the LT, then the HT, then the MT. And it now is a huge thing, which is brilliant and it's fantastic. But people say, well, but we want something stronger than Emacs because it breaks every now and then. I want to make go very, very thin. Well, then zirconium oxide came parallel, but zirconium oxide started to improve, and then many people changed it to zirconium oxide. And they're saying, well, but now zirconium oxide is kind of is too stiff, and, and, and you have now the generations, and now the very translucent zirconia is not as strong as the zirconia that I wanted, but the stronger one is too opaque, and sear prime appeared. So, mm. And that's the thing that now is, is probably the uh, uh, best combination because you have zirconia of different generations of different strength inside the same disc. So basically inside your final crown where you will have a core that will be stronger and more opaque and you will have the outer layers more translucent and less stronger but more stronger than email. So 
Is it going to be as beautiful as Emacs? Probably slightly less, but more beautiful than all the rest of the zirconias, and you will be able to go monolithic. So this is where it's located, and people did not understand that yet. So I believe this is a brilliant material that needs to prove itself. Of course, it's new, but at least from the theoretical point and from the development, this is really a great, great answer that is coming for, for filling the gap that we have between zirconia. So so two questions around that that I want to highlight. The one question is, is there any way of treating the fitting surface of this zirconia uh, to enhance the bonding? And the second question I want to ask is, is it available in, 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 in terms of the pack size? You know, is it a 98, 98.5? Is, is, is it a pack size that can be interchangeable with different milling units? Because some milling units only take a specific size, other milling units take a different size. Yeah, so from the bonding point of view, as far as I understand, there is nothing special, nothing new. So I will refer to the, because it's zirconia, basically. The, the, the magic, the new thing is that the generations are mixed and the strength are mixed, and not only the uh, colors mix, also the opacity. So that's the thing as far as I understand. So I will refer for bonding to, uh, there is a very good article from Marcus Platts from uh, UPenn, uh, that summarize all the, the, the knowledge that you basically have to know to bond zirconia, but in this regard, as far as I know, there's nothing new. Yeah. Okay. I don't so, know, maybe Mark, you, you you know that that better than me, but I believe that in bonding there is yeah. nothing special with zirconia. No, no, not at all. Sandblasting, um, you know, a uh, primer and and resin cement. You know, I think that's a standard protocol. And and of course, that article from Marcus is uh, it's ABC or A. Yeah, this is a great article, and it puts it in really clearly. But still, you know, I mean, you know, he. I know that he uh, and that group um, from from the the university are are very in favour of. For instance, like Maryland bridges, and really, I'm talking not just uh, full coverage restorations. They're yeah. you know, advocating partial coverage restorations where there is there is no retention. I'm not so sure that I would have the, the confidence to bond, you know, zirconia in a kind of a complete non-retentive way as I have the confidence with Emacs. To be honest with you, right. well, um, there are studies from Matthias Kern from the University of Kiel in Germany that are also yeah. doing that since years with good results. But probably mm. with Germans works better than with Chileans. I would or <laughs> <laughs> I still prefer to be one week Maryland's Emacs, and that works perfectly. Mm. Really amazing. Oh, yeah. As long as you have a good connector and a good surface, right. I I really rarely see uh, failures. You know, Mark, yeah. to, to touch on the topic of zirconia, I've got some cases that have been going for probably about 15 years now with uh, full monolithic zirconia that I bonded at the time. And yeah. I used Panavia for partial restorations. And I mean, the results were unbelievable. And if yeah. you look at the research, there's quite a few articles that advocate the chemical reaction that happens there. And it definitely creates some sort of bonding interface with, uh, with the zirconia. So just a comment on that. So, yeah, I mean, it's somehow like, like happened with, with Lava Ultimate from 3M that was that there was an indication of making crowns with it, uh, but the crowns were falling off in the States. There are a few studies proving that. And now they are not recommended to do that, not because the material was too weak and I was bringing it, it was because of the debonding, because the people were not bonding adhesively or they were not doing it properly. Mm. Now, at the end of the day, that was, mm. was behind that, that new indication. No. So, yeah, so and, and, and also just, just quickly to add to the, the zirconia, the new zirconia, the, the way it mills so beautifully is, is I think the trend or a lot of people and certainly in my practice, um, you know, there's a move towards a more kind of vertical and horizontal preparation. And so we're, we're having to mill, you know, bridges or, or single units with really quite fine margins and, and the material really holds up beautifully. To be yeah. honest, that that's one, for me one of the biggest changes um, that I found with the Zercat Prime. The, the Zerk Prime, it's beautiful. Yeah. So, so, so Mark, the, the Zercat Prime is it? How long has it been in South Africa? Because maybe it's the same one that we currently using. Because we've used Zercat for the last two and a half no, years. Yeah. No, no. 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 Not Prime. So Zercat was around. But yep. the prime has been around for about now uh, eight months. 
Yeah. So it's it's so their we, new we version of the Ravi probably end of last year. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Most part of the world, some part, some countries don't yeah. even have it yeah. because it's more expensive. Yeah, we have it. It's something that is is above zirconia. So you need to calculate it in the price of the unit, and it's going to be closer to a block than to a disc. Yeah, of course. And, and also one of the one of the fundamental difference with, instead of being multi-layer the layers are, are infused into each other so they they blend into each other whereas other zirconias you had definitive layers of, of chroma of of of, of opacity yeah. and yeah. to translucency whereas they have a, a really a new technology that infuses the opacity to the translucency so it's way more uh, natural looking to be honest than all Plus the other with sides. More resistances. yeah Different factors. Yes. Yes. Yeah, it goes from I think one thousand uh, about one thousand two hundred megapascals in the yeah. dentine shade up to six hundred and fifty in the enamel shade. So yeah. the, the, the the zirconia has a different strength as you're yeah. going through, but obviously you position the connectors if it's a bridge in the right place, um, which is super easy. Yeah. Good. So, so, so the next part of this, I pretty much want to start unpacking some of the analog workflows that we did and how we plan cases historically uh, to where we are today. And I think we've already touched uh, to some extent with that conversation in terms of, you know, the way we document the patients today, the way we scan the inside of the mouth, the way we create our 3D virtual models. Uh, and Eduardo, there's... There's the, 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 the two of your more recent studies that I pretty much want to bring up. Yeah. So I first want to discuss the relationship of the transverse occlusal plane to the layperson's perception in terms of harmony, a, a harmonious smile. Uh, yeah. Okay, let, let me share the screen so that we, we will put some images in our conversation and our faces are kind of smaller on the corner. So we'll put more pleasant faces now. Yeah, so let me see if it works. Uh, you should see my screen now. Let's see how it works. Your entire screen. Okay, share now. Okay. Yeah, now you should be see my screen. Uh, let's Good. go through here. Yeah. So one thing that we realized coming to uh, the facial flow topic, just a simple introduction for people that, that are not aware of that. The thing was that Bruno was, as I told you, the one first bringing this idea together. And then we jump up into the concept uh, for the publication that the traditional facial midline concept uh, has some problems because uh, it depends on the midline that you use the results that you're going to get and why is so important to understand this because basically we don't have a facial midline so you can consider half of the distance between the pupils or the commercial lines or the filtrum, or you can draw an average line between a nasion, the nose bridge filtrum and the chin. Uh, but at the end of the day, basically, depending from the line that you use, uh, you can have different positions and you're supposed to position your teeth in a different way. And we realized that when we were doing the DSD courses, when people were drawing the lines, uh, that uh, they were putting the lines completely different. And the whole idea uh, was proven with this study that I will show you now and we will jump into the, the can. That we published this a few years ago and the idea was that in a symmetrical model, we shifted the nose and the chin slightly to one side and we asked the people if they could realize if the teeth were inclinated or not and deviated. And when the teeth were deviated to the other side of the inclination of the nose, they realized it immediately. And when they were deviated to the same side of the nose and the chin, they were accepting even two millimeters. This is a symmetrical model. When you do it in 
asymmetrical model literature shows up to four millimeters. That's why we did it in symmetrical to, to really clarify the points. So um, that was, let me jump into this now. Uh, the vertical component of the facial flow that we published last year. And then we published this uh, at the end of last year, beginning of this year. I don't remember exactly the date of the study, I believe is here. Uh, yeah, end of last year. So, and then this is what we compare what was happening with an asymmetrical facial model and a symmetrical facial model, as you see, and here. And we inclinated now the occlusal plane to one side and to the other side. And then we started asking the people in an asymmetrical and a symmetrical model what was going on. And what we realized was that people noticed that. So let me go to the summary. So when you have an asymmetric face, here you can see in the clinical significance, the occlusal plane should be as parallel as possible to the interpupillary line. But very often it is not. So the question is, if it's not, do we use a, the natural head position or we kind of average the difference between the interpupillary line and a, the intercommissure line? And this is exactly what is our point, that we at the end, vertical, let me go back, at the end of the day, we don't have, go to a mall here, yeah. So at the end of the day, we don't have a real midline. So we connect the dots, the four main landmarks, and we create a flow, we create an inclination, we create a tendency where the face flows. That's the vertical component. And this is crucial for the deviation of the middle line, where we should put our teeth left to right. And if we follow this line to the green side, so we, where the line is going, we will tend to see less problems because we will have harmony. If we cross the line, we will have tension. And then we compare the horizontal lines, which the main one is going to be the interpupillary line and the intercommissure line, and we know that the interpupillary line, we don't change it, or it's very, very difficult to change, extremely difficult to change. Uh, and we will consider what happened with the intercommissure line or other horizontal lines to see how we're gonna place the teeth if we are not changing them. That's very relevant. This is a concept for diagnostics. So you decide based on what you see, if you're gonna make a nose surgery, if you're gonna botox one angle of the commissures to have it flat, so that you position your uh, occlusal plane at the right position based on that. Now I will stop sharing. So this is, this is basically the concept. So we have a horizontal component and the, uh, the vertical component and the horizontal component. And we diagnose what the patient has and if the nose is inclinated and the chin is inclinated to the other side, well, we might stay in the middle. If you have everything to one side, then you decide, oh, pr probably before making a big uh, dental treatment, we should probably have the nose first operated or the patient needs to know that if we put the teeth very straight, then it's not going to look fine if the nose doesn't get the surgery done. That's basically the idea behind it. So I think, you know, I think one of one of the main highlights uh, that, that that I took out of the the study for me uh, was the fact that you know you look at a large percentage of patients and you, you know there's, there's there are those deviations of the nose and the chin. Yeah. And you know, the minute you and 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 generally, you know, when you look at the orbits, you'll find that the orbits are generally symmetrical, and we can get an interpupillary line that's fairly horizontal. So that component is pretty predictable. Yeah. When we're looking at the transverse occlusal plane, we pretty much want to make sure that transverse occlusal plane is parallel to interpupillary line, and up to uh, I think your measurement was something like two degrees, if I'm not mistaken. 
it's yeah. still conceived as okay, even though the chin and the nose were three or four centimeters out. Yeah. So, and, and, and you know, that's the, whole, that's the whole beauty of actually being able to, to digitize these patients first, so you do all the analysis, and it allows you to communicate it with the patient to say, okay, fine, you know, let's do a mock-up, let's see what it's gonna look like, and let's see if we can if we can somehow or the other compensate for the deviations that are there. Yeah, and it's it's com I mean because it's complex to create a concept like this because I mean you want to simplify it, but you don't want to oversimplify it. But if it's not simple, people will not apply and they will get confused. So just to summarize, let me share uh, another case. Uh, look, so and. As now I'm sharing, yeah, as I show, as I told you before, so we published the vertical component and we're trying to create a classification uh, and a step-by-step -step protocol so that for everyone is really easy and understandable. We had a meeting last week and after the webinar with little Christian, we stay around one hour, one and a half hours discussing. Uh, and you can see here, look, this is something, this is a, nobody is seeing this. Look, this is the, horizontal component, this mm. is a draft of the new article. And here on the right side are all the points that we discussed during this one and a half hours. And it's not that simple. <laughs> Look, no, so, no. we have so many things that we want to consider. And so step one, step two, step three, four, five, six, but at the end of the day, it needs to be simple. Let me, and uh, there are so many factors that we, for example, should we consider four horizontal lines or just one or just two? And this is what we are trying now, based on many, many cases, trying to find. And look at this. This is a very good case that shows this. Imagine that this patient doesn't want any surgery. You, she doesn't want to have anything fixed beside her teeth. So with the classic ana analysis, she has one eye higher than the other one, if I look at two horizons. That's why we believe that natural head position is what we should consider. And if I'm gonna put her new teeth based on ortho veneers, whatever, this is not relevant at this point of the discussion because this is diagnosis. Uh, but on the contrary, if I analyze her from a more organic, biological and natural way, uh, her natural head position, this is how she looks at me most of the time, like the second picture. So I will base on the interpupillar line and then I will connect my four landmarks and I will create a flow towards her right side, so the left side of the screen. And if I now analyze the intercommissure line and how I, I suppose to leave the occlusal plane or inter incisive plane or canine plane, probably this is how I should put her teeth. And this is going to look a way better than if I put them totally straight based on the classical analysis. So, and if I look at how she looks now and how uh, these teeth were placed, they're following now the facial flow and therefore following now the horizontal component and I left them slightly inclinated following her natural asymmetries, respecting the green and the red side. This case, I believe that summarized quite uh, precisely the idea of what we're talking now. That was an amazing result, by the way. And it yeah, just shows no. how, how taking that and following facial and, and, and working with the facial flow, I mean, it's really an amazing result. Yeah, yeah, and, 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 I, you know, and also, I, I'd like to, and we've all been there, that, that our patients are um, as able to analyze these small discrepancies as well as maybe someone who's been qualified for 30 years. So this is a visual thing. This is not something that we can as dentists, you know, yeah. kind of uh, step behind because these patients, the moment they see it, they, they get this analysis straight away. So it's super important because this is, you know, for us often a big investment. And, you know, to yeah. be honest, for a lot of dentists who aren't planning, if you think about this logically, these teeth can either be straight, but most of the time they can either be slightly canted one way or the other way. And this is for happening for dentists who are not doing planning. Um, and I think that really over the years, a lot of cases went really badly wrong because they were slightly canted uh, towards the side of tension. And no yeah. one really understood why this case looks so terrible. <laughs> 
and everyone was so unhappy, but it was just that it was ever so slightly um, going against the, the flow of the face, you know, and so the article really has I think, helped many people understand that even just a slight discrepancy, as long as it's in the right way, is a problem, is not a problem, but as soon as it goes the other way, it's a yeah. catastrophe. Yeah, yeah that's some a big thing. Have it natural. Some people just see a patient and have it natural, other people don't have it, but this yeah. is important for the lab. I mean, the lab needs to have pictures. The lab needs to have the scan. The lab, need, the lab needs to have a face scan. I mean, whatever, 2D, 3D, 4D, but just give the lab something, not just an impression, not just, and again, the same. Digital is not saving us because if you send an intro, yeah. scan, it's basically the same than the silicon impression. So you're not helping the lab with just a simple no. intro. Mm -hmm. You need to have some pictures or mm -hmm. a face scan. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and we'll get into it. We'll get into it and just have one question because Obviously, for some patients as well, that and I think that hopefully we're going to have a chance to chat about it. But you know, that's been my experience that uh, if I take maybe three different photographs, so maybe a, a rest and a, a sort of half smile and then full smile, the flow is even changing as we're looking at the photograph. So it becomes really that we have to understand that one photograph is not going to be enough for us to make a decision on facial flow. Of course, most of the people, for example, we know that. I mean, we're dentists. Most of the people have a deviation that is increasing. Mm -hmm. When you open more, I mean, if someone mm. is laughing and smiling with an open mouth, in most of the people, the chin will go either to the right or to the left and will not stay in the center. So, or some people will just move sideways and then backwards. And depending on how open the mouth is, you will think that the facial flow might go to that side, but then all of a sudden, one mm. millimeter afterwards is going to be back to the mm. middle. That's why it is important to take simple videos and the beauty of the time where we live now is that you don't need any special camera or light, you just need an iPhone, mm -hmm. iPhone or, or any smartphone. I don't have interest with, with Apple. Mm -hmm. Any new modern smartphone can make beautiful videos that would just serve the purpose for any facial ana analysis. Yeah. So, so, so that brings me to the next thing I want to chat about, Roger. I mean, we know how important it is to capture these dynamic images. Yeah. And if you look, you know, so, so, so we've got facial flow, we've got occlusal plane. I mean, there's so many concepts. I mean, Bruno has been incredible in terms of creating the, the, the first concepts around facial flow. Some of the first articles are read around the concept. You know, Carl Stanley talking about the, the you know, the, the actual length of the upper lip and the mobility of the upper lip and how that all plays a role. But one of the other key criteria that I want to highlight today is the pink white ratio, you know? And I mean, there's the, the two or three classifications out there in terms of classifying that the amount of ginger vulture. I mean, there's Jensen, there's John, uh, there's Liebert, uh, and, 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 and pretty much they all, they all classify on, on more or less the same level, you know? Class one or type one is very high ginger vulture beyond two millimeters. Top, uh, class two is pretty much two millimeters of ginger vulture. show. Top, uh, class three is, you know, you just pretty much have that patient that just shows the incidental papilla, and top yeah. four is, is, is a low smile line. So how important is it in terms of making that evaluation? And I actually want you to highlight one of your articles yes. around static versus dynamic images and how it captures that and how it feeds into treatment yeah. plans. Yeah, there was a, a, I will share the screen now again. So the, there was a beautiful article because most of the literature that, here we are. We published it in the Journal of Prosthetic Dentistry. Uh, that was, I believe it's with day 2020, if I don't remember. It was, it's all very, very recent. I oh, know, 2019. Yeah, so. Here, let me show you some of the pictures. The idea was that most of the studies at that time were in the ortho literature. Just, uh, so let me have a second. The two little dwarfs came here to my mm -hmm. office. Uh, baby, I'm yeah, happy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One, I need you to give me 10 more minutes, baby, yeah? I will tell you later, yeah. Give me 10 mm -hmm. more minutes, baby. Yeah, now we're back. <laughs> so, uh, now, I was talking about the literature. The ortho literature 
was had two or three articles before ours and nothing in resto prosto or any other field in dentistry about a dynamic smile analysis but the funny part is although the ortho people had it the ortho were just making pictures for their analysis although that was in the literature so nobody was really taking videos that was the funny part and i took a video of this patient and look if i show you the first four pictures you see that we could probably stop at that at d and this could have probably been the smile that you were analyzed for treatment i mean he has good teeth and a beautiful smile and now look at e and f so and this happens with many many patients so what we did was we took pictures of around 500 people at our university and most of the study was covering just 50 people 60 people 100 people maximum so let me show you this and here are some examples and this is the beauty of it so some people are changing a bit a and b some people are starting with the social smile into the spontaneous smile already with a full genital display some people have lower smiles we know that and some people for example the g picture i know this guy and i never thought that he has a gummy smile because he's faking always the smile because he doesn't like to show it so but when he really smiles freely you get that let me uh stop sharing now so that i can see you yeah so and this is very important because we were we base our diagnosis on pictures or smiles that are not the real ones that's first and the second is that we believe that there were very few people with gummy smiles and we were told in dental school that that was not fine and that was not beautiful and that was not correct and we have to fix it but all of a sudden this study we realized that 80 percent of young females have some sort of gummy smile some sort of complete gingival display 60 percent of young male so that became this becomes the normality and not the exception so we don't necessarily have to treat it then why we were told uh, that we had to treat it because and um, why patients supposed not to like it that's the funny part and they don't like it because they have other things because they have crooked teeth because the teeth are yellow because they are not aligned because they have feelings that are not fine because they uh, they don't fit in the smile there are so many reasons but the gingiva was not the main one so it's it's a reason but when you have and this is the next study that we're close to publish now whenever you have more than three millimeters of gingival displays you don't like it that's definitely some people between two and three but everything that is below two millimeters of complete gingival display is pretty normal and it's very acceptable for most, the vast majority of the people we did the interviews now in the five continents. We have, I don't know how many hundred people. And that was also really nice to see that Asians, Caucasians, Black Africans, uh, uh, Black Americans, Latinos, we all think the same. We like kind of the same gingival display. And this was really nice to see. And that's why we did the study in so many centers. Oh, that's that's kind of the summary of the study. No, I think it just it, it, it highlights it highlights everything. You know the need for dynamic record taking, and you know from there it then opens up the other avenues. And exactly like you say, you know it's there's other reasons that they dislike their smile other than the gingiva. And if we found that you know we did that evaluation, we did the assessment, you know then it opens up the the avenue where we can start looking at other causes. You know delayed path of eruption, maxillary excess and other forms of, uh, of discrepancies. But the main thing is we need to understand that it's normal. And that's not what we were taught at dental school, you know? Yeah. No. So, no. so, so on the, on the no. last note, geez, we've already gone for almost an hour. On, a, on, on an ending yeah. note, uh, oh, of, uh, Jesus that's crazy. why it's <laughs> one hour and they are feeling it now. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. 
so, so this is an ending note. I just want you, uh, uh, you know, how has how has this whole COVID thing affected you guys, and uh, you know what's happening on your side with the university and with the clinic? Well, university are closed, 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 closed. We are trying to come back with pre-clinic work. Well, I, I don't teach undergrad, so it's just a postgrad. And there are smaller groups, so it would make it easier. But we are trying in July to come back. But, you know, Chile, we had a, a kind of small wave in March, which was controlled. Then we were kind of fine. And now most of Chile is fine, but in Santiago we have a big mess. This is a mess. It's like New York, but in our style, of course. We are less people. We have a 7 million. Uh, we have a Corfu since three months, uh, but we had mobile quarantines. But the problem was that it, most of the people are not obeying. Very simple. It's not as strict as in South Africa. There is no such a big control. And there are studies now proving that the, the mobility of people were reduced in some areas by 20%, which is absolutely useless. And in some neighborhoods, up to 60%. But nobody is, is reaching 70%. That's why we have a big mess now. Until now, not many deaths. The, the, the public system, the health system in Chile is still working. It's, close to collapse since three weeks, but didn't collapse yet. So we we need to see what's gonna happen during the next month. But now we see a little trend coming slightly down in Santiago, which is the main problem in the country. So we hope in July to come back to the universities. Dental clinics are, many are closed, many are open. There is no official statement pushing you to close. But of course, there are a lot of advices that just urgencies should be done. And that, of course, we need to keep all the, 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 the health and biological measures uh, that are worldwide kind of the same. That's our situation now. Yeah. Yo, I'm uh, sure. Just, just, a, just one question that I have, which I, what, what's the population of Chile, by the way? 17 million. We have seven. So one, one, one seven. Yeah. Okay. And, and how many dentists do you have in Chile? Oh, in Chile, we have one of the worst or best rates of dentists. It depends from where you see it. <laughs> we have around 26,000 dentists. So we have around one dentist per 600 people. That's crazy. Oh, wow. That's a lot. A lot, a lot, a lot. A lot. Crazy. That's a lot. Yeah, yeah. So how Chile, many dental yeah. schools then? What was the number? What was the number? I missed the number. Um, we have around 26,000. So to give you an example, Germany has around 75,000 dentists for 84 millions with three times our income per head. So it's really, we have really a lot, a lot, a lot of dentists. A lot of dentists. As, uh, the competition is huge and our income per head is like Portugal, slightly less than Portugal, a bit more than Greece kind of Croatia, that's the income per head we have. So that you give, it gives you an idea of the economy. Yeah. But I mean, so, a lot that's of crazy. You know, in South Africa, we have, yeah. we have uh, just under 60 million people, I think. Is that right? Uh, yeah. And we have, I, I found out yesterday, we have 5,000 5, working dentists. Imagine. No, here in Chile, it's crazy, it's crazy, it's crazy. No, but yeah, at the end of the day, amazing. I think, mean, as I, say, as I always say, the problem is the competition is not the dentist. It's that people don't have the money or don't see the necessity or the importance of having dental treatment. I mean, even for us, if all of us, 26,000 dentists, would work all day long, we will not be able to help all the population with all the dental problems that they have. The problem is that most of the people don't have the money. Or some people that have the money don't see it as a priority. It's not the number of dentists problem even with mm. 50,000 dentists in a country like us we could work 10 years long to heal all people mm. that's not the problem right. in every country although that's another message that i would like to give to the people it doesn't matter how poor your country is or how wealthy your country is there are always good dentists they're always leading clinics we know that there are good clinics in portugal there are good clinics in argentina there are good clinics in, in mm. south africa it depends on how you strive, how the, the drive that you have to do that and mm. to push. And mm. in some countries, it might be easier than others, but you will always, in every country, have good clinics. I mean, I have seen good clinics in Peru and Bolivia that are supposed to be poor countries. Mm. Mm. And I have seen really shitty clinics in Germany or in the States, things where you don't mm. want to go in. 
Yep. So, <laughs> yeah, then, it depends from how we see dentistry and how we position ourselves. And, uh, and it is very simple. In cases where dentists might not have the money to open a big clinic, you can enter in a big clinic as, as an employee and then make your, your way through. I have seen many examples of that. Yeah, may, maybe this, this, this COVID situation is a good opportunity for us to kind of not uh, to reboot our profession, you know, to make people yeah. aware of really the importance yeah. of oral health. You know, maybe yeah. this is the opportunity that we've been missing because, you know, for many years we've been on this mission to, to do restorative whatever it is. But I think maybe this is a great opportunity for us to, to reboot the profession a little bit in a, a slightly different direction. And two simple, yeah, two, two, yeah, just two simple ideas. Let me share the screen again. So I believe that it might be a shift that was already going on. The dentist, historically, we have always been working by ourselves in little clinics. And probably now is the last push that we need to understand with. We need to come together, either as partners or employees, or, but bigger clinics are the option because you can control everything away better. So let me show you, this is our clinic. So let me, now I believe, yeah, now it's gone. So of course for us, the social distancing is easy if you have such a waiting room. Yep. That is the thing. And uh, we have, uh, the elevators are coming like a penthouse inside the clinic and we have our own parking slots down. So if you have this, uh, infrastructure, uh, of course, it's much easier to work and you can have, instead of one single dentist, have a single clinic. I mean, five single dentists can come together and have a bigger clinic. I mean, the math is very simple. And this is what I encourage young uh, colleagues to do, that instead of, of trying to be independent, that is going to be more and more, di more difficult just to come together. And 100%. Yeah, let me show you just one. No, I, I, I agree that. Sorry, tell me. I lost you, Mark. Yeah, no, no, it's fine. I, 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 you know, I, I keep telling dentists that really, if I was them, we have an, a, a fairly big practice as well. We have lots of a few chairs and yeah. I, I keep telling dentists that if I was on my own somewhere right now, I would go to all the opposition and I would say, guys, let's forget about being opposition. Let's just join yeah. everything into one big pool. Really, it would be, I've been saying it already two or three years, you know, yeah. that, that really we need to consolidate. Also, yeah, not just be, because of the, but because of equipment, because of, you know, all the expensive equipment that we can share. You um, need all of this stuff. Need to expensive equipment. Yeah, yeah that's our colleagues and not our enemies. And I don't know why we were told yeah. so metal school. It's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. I mean yeah. Yeah. I mean this is this is my take on it, Edward. I mean everything that we saw happening with pre COVID nineteen is just gonna be accelerated and amplified through this, you know? Yeah. Consolidation of dental clinics, it was something that was gonna happen. We're gonna see a lot more of it becoming efficient, limiting our hours, slowing down our, our, our work. I mean, all of it is now no longer, oh, we should be doing it. We have to do it. So yeah. if anything, you know, I think there's going to be great positives that come out. And, yeah. you know, on that note, I don't want to keep you any longer. I know that you've got yeah. other commitments. I know you've got yeah, to keep yeah. waiting. I'll show you the last, the last thing. Like, let me no, show you. Yeah. yeah, because... So, let me. So I've got something really interesting for you because the reality is you'll be surprised when I tell you that uh, in about six months uh, it will be my anniversary of being a dentist for forty years. I have really? been practicing. Congratulations! <laughs> well, yeah, forty years. Really, Mark? It's I will, crazy, huh? I will become forty in a couple of months. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine how crazy that is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let me show you the last thing. Look. So if anybody, so here is the, here is my Instagram where I put what, what we're doing today, the cocktail hour webinar. If anybody would like to read a few things about the COVID, 
I put many statements and, and, and slides and explanation about masks, about respirators, about saliva, what's the evidence that we had at that time. Uh, and basically, I'm not saying that it's not dangerous. So I'm basically proving that there are a lot of evidence lacking and we have some evidence regarding certain things. Uh, you can just take time and, and read that with, uh, when you have the time. And let me show you what, what basically how life is. This is the last, one of the last posts that I put. Look at this. Look at this video. And this proves how tough life is. I was trying to lift this bar. You can see that didn't work well. Yeah. I saw this. Yeah, I was trying again, but there is a point where hard work pays off and nothing comes and falls from heaven. That's what we have to understand. And no. that took me, I mean, I'm not the clinic, that's, that's my worst exercise, but it took me one year to bring that, one, a little bit more than one year. So let me unshare the screen now. That's amazing. You know, yeah. and, and I, I'll, I'll add one thing that, you know, been, having been around now for 40 years of dentistry, I'll be honest that never has dentistry been more exciting yeah. and never, in my opinion, has there been, you know, just so many amazing things to be, to yeah. be done as, in, in dentistry as, as today. You know, today yeah. is really the most fantastic time in those 40 years to be. That's why I'm not stopping. Yeah, look, and just to close, the same idea is this is a case, it looks fine. You, you can take a look. You can see my Instagram is EDOMAHN. This is the final result, but if you see where we started, I mean, that was around two years before the patient had missing laterals and canines. And of course, that went with ortho, that took time. With mini screws, we had to distalize that segment. There is the screw. Then we had to put the implants. We, well, we did immediate loading, but we have to wait till it heals, until the teeth move. And after all of that effort, at the end, you come to this. This is not falling from heaven. It's not, it's not for nothing. And of course, and there is a lot of knowledge of the implants, of gingival tissues, of ceramics, and so on, and so on, and so on. So let me unshare the screen now. So this is a, the final message that it takes time, it takes effort, and maybe some people see the practices that you have that are great and think that everything came from, from nowhere, but there is a lot of effort behind and time and investment, and, and uh, this is what we have to appreciate. I think I think that's what it boils down to at the end of the day, Eduardo. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, nothing just falls from the sky. It all comes with hard work. It comes with motivation, and it comes with that persistence that uh, that that pulls everything together. You know, yeah. so you know, like I always say, with the challenge we face now, you know, like Mark puts it, you know, there isn't more exciting time in the industry than now. But with the challenges we face now, it's no different to any other challenges that that we faced. You know. Exactly. Yeah. At the end of the day, it's a challenge. You know, you've got to deal with it. You've got to accommodate it. You've got to find a working flow around it. And you've got to get on with it. Yeah. But I must tell you, for, for all of you that are watching, you've got to go and follow Eduardo's Instagram profile. But even more exciting has been his Facebook profile because, I mean, through the COVID-19, when uh, from, from about the last two or three months, he's probably one of the guys that kept some sanity going for me because he would he, he would research the articles and when you go through his feed you'd find big circles around these articles saying nobody yeah. died. Yeah. My, my, my best post in Wanda, my best yeah. post <laughs> was the one where you said, you know, aerosols are so bad, we should all stop practicing. People are gonna have no more teeth. Yeah, <laughs> and, <laughs> no, it's, it, 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 it was really funny. It was yeah, really I mean, funny. It's never, of course, it's risky. I mean, we can, I can get sick if I'm treating patients, uh, not only from COVID, from other things too. Now we have COVID, and this is probably a little bit more dangerous than other things. And zero risk means no treating patients, but this is going to last for a while. So, if somebody is able not to work the whole year, I mean, uh, that's great. I'm fine with that, but I'm not. Likewise. So, 
That's the thing. Yeah. So Eduardo, once again, thank you very much. Yeah, really, thank, thank you. you. It's been a, a, an absolute honor. And yeah, all of you are watching. Yeah, if any member would like to have the studies, just share my email. Or I don't know how to write it here in the in the live comments, uh, but you can just share with it, or people can contact me per Instagram privately. That's fine, and I can just forward the studies that we discussed today. Uh, thank you. Here we go. Oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah. privately. Yeah. And uh, we'll pop it onto onto our Facebook page as well, so that uh, yeah, uh, I hope, and I hope to see you in South Africa one more time. Yeah, it was amazing that trip. I was thinking with really? my wife yesterday. It was six? It was. I was not a father at that time yet. My son is becoming six now, so it was more than six years ago. And my wife was not pregnant, so seven years ago, at least. Okay, so we will definitely get you back. Where, where were you when you arrived? Where did you start? It was probably 2014, because my son was born in 2015. So probably it was 2014. 2014. Time slides. So, 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 so here's the deal. We look forward to having you over. Yeah. When we finally yeah. get to have our next DDS conference. So yeah. I hope we'll that I will survive. Definitely. And we're going to go to the Kruger. We're going to go to the Kruger. Yeah, great. Perfect. Once Definitely. again, and you bring your children, your family. family. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, hug from the distance. Yeah, Mark. How okay, to meet you. Uh, yeah, bye bye. Yeah. Thank you guys. Thank you for everything. Yeah, bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.